Spin the flag. Hi. I know I look like I'm 17, but uh, I'm, I'm actually 15. And, no, I'm 24. I know I'm young. Um, but uh, if God could speak through an ass, he can speak through me. Amen. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> Somebody stare out that way. <laughs> hey, it's biblical. Yeah, that's <laughs> true. So, uh, with that, let's pray. Uh, uh, Lord, help us. Father, thank you for who you are. We're just so grateful that uh, you're within each and every one of us, Father, that we don't have to ask you to come to this place, that you're already here within us. Um, we're so grateful that what you did on the cross was enough for us in every moment of our lives. Father, help us see that in a new way today. Help us be just blown away by your grace, blown away by what you've done, and blown away by who you've made us. <clears throat> in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, so I decided this morning to, about five minutes ago, to just talk about maybe one chapter of the book, because on Sunday, I'm going to give you a, uh, really an overview of each part of the book, okay? So today, this morning, we're going to just dig in a little bit on one little section, and so if you have the book, it's actually chapter 13, and so we find this this phrase in scripture that says that we're going to be judged by our deeds or judged by our works. And in my book, um, I address each one of these things. And before I jump into this, it's, it's worth noting that when Jesus teaches on reward, he always does uh, so in the singular. And when Paul teaches and when all the New Testament teaches on this idea of a reward, it's always done in the singular. Now, if you've been in church for any period of time, you've probably heard that if you're good enough, you can collect all these rewards and all these crowns. Well, it's worth noting that in the New Testament, they're always spoken of in the singular, that we get a crown of life for glory or righteousness, that we get in a, a, a reward. And I come to the conclusion, based on the overwhelming New Testament evidence, that Jesus and that eternity is our reward, that Jesus is our crown of righteousness, that Jesus is our crown of life, that Jesus is our crown of glory. And when Jesus taught on this, he taught of it in the uh, vineyard workers. Have you heard this story where the vineyard workers showed up and some showed up in the morning and worked all day, some showed up three hours later and worked, and then some showed up six hours into the day, and some showed up an hour before the day was over. And at the end of the day, the, the boss came and he paid them all the same. Now, some were grumbling, but this is grace. No matter when you show up, whether it's on your deathbed or whether it's at five, grace means everything is free and everyone gets paid the same. And because we all get Jesus, we all get overpaid. Amen? We all get overpaid no matter what. So this, this begs the question, and I'll talk about this in a little bit. If we all get paid the same, if the reward is all the same, then what's the point of doing good works? And we'll talk about that at the at the end. But I'm going to go through a few different passages um, just to sort of flesh this out. Of course, I talk about it some more in the chapters before. <coughs> Paul in 1 Corinthians 3. Can I interject here? Absolutely. Uh, why don't you tell us uh, who you are, where you're from, and someone that brought you up to where you are now. I mean, as far as, you probably might have had a really good life experience to get with this kind of knowledge. Yeah, so, uh, Zach Maldonado is a pastor. Uh, uh, Speaker and author. No, so, yeah, um, I'll do that. So, uh, so I'm 24, and I just finished uh, my Master of Arts in Theology from Fuller Seminary. It's one of the largest seminaries in the nation. I got an undergrad degree from a Baptist university. Um, before that, I grew up in a very um, performance-based home. All of my siblings and family members were athletes. We were um, all all-state athletes, so there's a lot of pressure to not only be good at sports but be good academically. Um, so it was just the rat race. My dad was uh, is I'm half Mexican, so my dad's Hispanic, and I grew up doing construction work. And so it was you got to work hard to get what you want. So there was this. Work hard mentality, rough mentality. My dad was a, is a rough man, just a very like, bolt, you better straighten up, you know, sort of thing. And so between, between a, a, a very a rough dad 
and a very performance-based home, I grew up thinking that my Father in Heaven was the same way. Mm -hmm. That I had to perform in order to get, that I had to do better, he was never pleased with me. Mm -hmm. He never really loved me, he kind of loved me because maybe he gave me life and he provided for me. But never, it was never a personal, I love you sort of thing. So that caused many years of legalism and burnout. And about six years ago, I started on this journey of the new covenant, of what it means to be under God's grace, of what it means to be loved without condition, of what it means to wake up every morning and know that Father is pleased with me, not because of how great I performed the day before, but because I'm simply his child. Um, and so... Uh, I started asking questions, and, and one of the things that I realized was that the truth that I was hearing wasn't setting me free. And Jesus said the truth, he, him, would set me free. And so I realized that if the truth we are hearing isn't setting us free, then it's not the truth. Because truth always sets us free, and error always puts us into bondage. So specifically for this book, I started thinking, okay, why is there so much fear on this day? Because 1 John 4, 17 tells us that we can have confidence on the day of judgment. That when we die and we face God on that day, that we can be ecstatic. That we, Hebrews 9 says, that we can eagerly await Him. And so I started looking at all these verses and going, there has to be a, an easier answer. There has to be something simpler. There has to be a truth amongst all of these somewhat difficult verses that can really set us free. So um, that's why I wrote the book. Uh, it's, it's about six years of, of learning, but then about 24 years of, uh, you know, about 18 years of unlearning some truths. And um, so I'm here today, and uh, I'm, I mean, this is my passion. Uh, Paul says in Acts 20, 24, better than anyone else, he says, I, I consider my life worth nothing to me except proclaiming the awesome grace of God. And that's what I feel like my life is. Uh, I, I have no, uh, this is the funnest thing in the world, the greatest thing in the world. I love it with all my heart. And it is my absolute passion to see people believe that Jesus is really enough, that the cross really worked for them in their moment, in their life, in their relationship with God, in their relationship with others, that the cross is really enough, that it worked the first time, and that there's nothing we need to do to get more favor from God, to get more uh, blessing from God, to get more forgiveness or acceptance or whatever from God, because Jesus did it for us. Um, and so when I was reading all these New Covenant books, I, I hadn't found one that really addressed this topic fully. Um, and so I, I think that what I do in this book is, for the first time, address every difficult passage on judgment and give us a complete picture of how we can have confidence. And so part one of this book talks about how we're totally forgiven. And I address all the difficult passages that some use to say we're not forgiven. And I address those and reveal to you, hey, you're totally forgiven. And the second part, what I'm talking about now, I... Uh, I talk about all the difficult passages on judgment that some try to use to create fear, to create man manipulation. And then in the third part, I talk about how our God is good and how because of that we can be safe and secure in our salvation, that we can't lose it, that what does discipline look like in light of God's grace. Uh, I talk about what God's will looks like in light of God's grace. Um, and so I, I think um, this book really ties a bow around this issue and a few other issues and gives us a nice look um, at what judgment, forgiveness, and life in Christ looks like. Amen. Does that help? Yeah. Excellent. All right. So, first How Corinthians about the humble 3. part? I like that. Uh, <laughs> I'm working on it. Do we have any ushers take care of this guy? <laughs> I'm working on it. Um, so, so 1 Corinthians 3, Paul, Paul talks about this idea of being built on Christ. Now, some have used this passage to say, hey, look, if you, if you don't do enough good things, you're not going to get blah, 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 blah. But as we look at this passage, as I give you an overview, it's interesting to note that, once again, the word reward is used in the singular. Um, and really, at the beginning of this passage, 
Paul is talking about him and Apollos, and he's saying, look, um, we each will receive a reward. Now, so then he goes on and he starts comparing his work to Apollos. He says, you know, I planted, Apollos watered, but God, uh, God gives the growth, so it's really not about us, it's about God, and he will receive his wages according to his labor. What does that mean? Well, as we look later, Paul says that his reward is preaching the gospel. And so I believe at the first part of this scripture, Paul's really not talking about some heavenly wage or heavenly reward, but he's actually talking about the reward right now that they were getting from preaching the gospel. So, for example, when I preach the gospel today, Sunday, next week, whatever, there is a... Uh, there is a personal reward that I get just from experiencing what it, what it means to allow Christ in me to preach the gospel. In the same way that tomorrow or today later when you go and you serve your wife or you go and you do something good, you get a personal reward of experiencing it, participating with Christ. I mean, you can look back in your life and you go, yeah, man, when I, when I helped that homeless man or when I, when I served my wife in that way or when I, when I whatever... I got to participate with Christ, and there's that personal reward that you get, right? And so that's what I believe is happening here, because as we continue through, um, we look and we see that uh, Paul goes on and says, "According to the grace of God given to me." And so now he's going to talk about building. All right, so he's like, "Okay, are you going to build on a firm foundation or not?" And so what I think he's talking about is, look. Are you going to trust in Jesus or not? Because every work you do in dependence on God is a work that is going to last forever. So when we get to heaven one day, are we going to celebrate our sins? No, they've been taken away. God remembers them no more, right? So when we get to heaven, we, we're going to celebrate for all of eternity everything that Jesus did at the cross, but also everything that we allow Jesus to do through us. That makes sense? And so, just like today, that we get to celebrate things we did years ago, in, in heaven, we get to celebrate for all of eternity things we let Christ do. So, are we building our foundation of works on what who Jesus is, or are we building it on something that's going to be burned up? So, when God judges our works, He's not judging them to, dis, to determine the reward that we're going to get. But he's saying, okay, what was done by trusting me and what wasn't? The things that weren't, hey, they've been taken away once and for all. Jesus took care of that. So these things are going to be celebrated forever. That's why Paul says in Colossians 3.24 that our reward is an inheritance. Now, I've never received an inheritance, but I hope I do one day. Uh, but what's an inheritance? Is an inheritance worked for or is an inheritance given because you're a part of the family? Mm -hmm. So our reward is our inheritance. In the book of Hebrews and other places, it says that we are heirs to this promise. We're heirs. You don't work for an inheritance. You get an inheritance because you're part of the family. If we're in Christ, guess what? Jesus isn't ashamed to call us brothers. That's what Hebrews says. So we are heirs because we're part of the family. And so God is going to give us all of heaven. He's already given us all of his son, all of his son, just simply because we're in the family. You don't work for an inheritance. That's why Paul says our reward is our inheritance. Does that make sense? And so as we look, um, Paul says that if the work they built on Christ remains, that they will receive a reward. That reward, I believe, is the eternal celebration that they got to participate in God's work. What a joy. And I think we lose sight of this. What a joy it is to wake up every day and just live life knowing that Christ is living through me. You know that Christ living through you is not a feeling. Christ living through you is you being yourself. I mean, you brushing your teeth in the morning, you taking out the trash, you driving your truck down the, down the highway. Whatever's not sin is faith. And faith and trust in Jesus, that's him living his life through you. There's no third way to walk, friends. There's only two ways to walk. After the Spirit, after the flesh. After God, after sin. So when you're not sinning, what are you doing? You're depending on Jesus. You're trusting Jesus. That's why, that's why everything you do can be righteous. <coughs> Waking up, putting your clothes on, kissing your wife, 
making breakfast, talking around the table. Those are all things done in dependence on Christ. Isn't that cool? But all these little things we do, we're doing with God. It doesn't feel like it all the time. I mean, we think about works and, and, and things done in Christ, like all the big missionary things or preachers or whatever. But no, man, every little thing is an opportunity to participate with God right here, right now. I mean, we're, we're, so, we're so prone, like, I want to get to heaven. And we're like, dude, heaven's now. I mean, when, when we get to heaven, sure, no more sin and no more tears and things like that. But you realize that, that what makes heaven so great is Jesus. Amen. And what makes you so great is Jesus. And he's in you right now. Isn't that cool? Amen. So, so we, we get that eternal reward. We don't have that wasted time. Right? We don't have that wasted time of sinning. And so that eternal reward is that participation in God's work. So um, we see that in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10 through 13. You can sort of read through that. And then verse 15, it says that any, anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Well, what is the loss here? The loss is not having work that is eternal. That's why the, it says in the next verse, it says the person is still saved. So Paul's not talking about loss of salvation here. He's talking about loss of that, that eternal reward you get when you trust in Jesus. It's not about a loss of, of more square footage in heaven or more crowns. I mean, the idea that we're going to have all these crowns, I mean, we're going to get a crick in our neck from all our righteousness if we start stacking all these things on our head. But no, we see when we look, I talk about this in the book, but when we look at it, we have the crown of life, the crown of glory, the crown of righteousness, the crown of peace. Who's our peace? Who's our life? Who's our righteousness? Who's our glory? Amen? Right? And so um, that's what we see. So reward in this passage, it's not about that. And then so we, 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 go, we move on and we see in 1 Corinthians 4 that, that, um, what, that we're each going to receive praise from God. And once again, this is not individual or eternal different rewards, but... This is not varying degrees of rewards, but this is just recognition that on that day, God's going to go, man, I love you. You're so awesome. You're so good. Oh, but, you know, we're thinking, oh, but God, I only did this much. And he's like, are you kidding me? One thing in dependence of me, I loved it. Even if he didn't do that one thing, I still loved it. I still loved you because I made you. It's not about what you do. And so as we move on, there's a, there's a phrase that really... Uh, screws up a lot of people. It's in 2 Corinthians 5. And it says that everyone will appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body. Now people say, see Zach, we're going to receive what is due. Well, notice it says whether good or evil. So I believe that there's one judgment. Some, some teach that there's two. But in both places, and I talk about this in the book, both places that the judgment seat of Christ is mentioned, it always has believers and unbelievers in view. Because think about this. It says, each, all, all, who's all? Well, all is all. In the original Greek, all means all. Okay? From when it's all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due. Can believers receive evil? No. Why? Jesus took away that evil, right? Can, can unbelievers receive good at the judgment seat? No. No, they can't. They can only receive what they what what is due them, evil. So this verse is contrasting. Are you in Christ? Okay, you're going to receive good. Are you are you not in Christ? Okay, you're going to receive what's due to you, evil. And so that's why this is a contrast. And in other places, Paul mentions in Romans two, Paul mentions that the world is going to be judged according to their deeds. When you read Romans one and two, Paul's setting up this argument. He says, "Look, everyone's guilty." Whether Jew or Gentile, you're guilty. And so if you want to be justified by what you're doing, if you want to be justified by the law, if you want to be justified by your morality, then you're going to be judged according to what you do. And then he moves on and he says, look, that God will he'll judge the secrets of men. Once again, this is all in context of unbelievers. That's why, friends, context is always our best friend. And so... Paul says in Romans 2, he says, if anyone does good, they can earn eternal life. And then he moves on to chapter 3, and he says, well, I say that, but no one is righteous. No one does good. So you can try, but you can't do it. That's why 
Romans 2 is, is the judgment found in Romans 2 is setting up the argument to say, you can try it, but you can't do it. That's why in Romans 3, 23, thank God we are all justified freely by God's grace. Freely by God's grace, because it's not about what we do. We are made right by faith apart from works. Paul says this in Romans 3, 28 and 5, 1. And then he says later in Romans 11, if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. So Paul says we're, we're saved by grace and that our salvation isn't based on works. <clears throat> so this is why we can have confidence before God, because our salvation is not based on what we do, but on what Jesus has done for us. First Peter 1 says that, that God judges according to each one's deeds, and in context we see that Peter is encouraging the church. In 1 Peter 1, 16, he says, Be holy as I am holy. And some people take that as legalism. And God's saying, Dude, be yourself. I've made you holy once for all, Hebrews 10, 10. So guess what? Stop being an idiot and live like who you are. If you're a fish, swim. If you're a bird, fly. But fishes shouldn't fly and birds shouldn't swim. In the same way, holy children of God, like we are, shouldn't really be sinning. Yeah, we sin, we mess up. Hello, let's admit it. Okay? But it's no longer our default. Right? Yeah. Our default is walking after the Spirit. Our default is being the children of God that God has made us. We're new. We're right. We're still learning what that looks like. We're still learning what that means. We don't always live that way and walk that way. But God's saying, hey man, I'm not asking you to be something you're not. I'm asking you to be something that you are. Because your old way, that's unnatural for you now. And so we see that Peter is saying, look, we were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. We were, uh, I want you to live holy, not in order to uh, earn anything. But I want you to be yourself because I know that sin isn't good for you. Um, so once again, when we see these, this idea, it's all about what are you doing? Are you going to do something that lasts eternally or are you going to do something that gets burned up? Because a thing that lasts, etern lasts for eternity, it's better. It's worth it. It's not wasted time. It's funny that, you know, uh, in Revelation and other places, when it talks about being judged by deeds, unbelievers are judged by their deeds too. But what do they all get? They all get the same punishment. In the same way, we all get the same reward. And so on that final day, and I talk about this in the book, on that final day, there's not going to be a movie film of our sins. I don't know where we got that idea, but if you ask 90% of Christians, they think that God's going to put a blockbuster of their, uh, their sins up on in heaven. Well, guess what, friends? The film, the record, Colossians 2, 13 and 14, says it's been torn up, nailed to the cross. There's nothing condemning you. It's been canceled. It's been taken away as far as the east is from the west. So on that day, we're going to be treated like Jesus because 1 John 4, 17 says, as he is, so are we in this world. Mm -hmm. Right now. Mm -hmm. Jude 24 says that, that the, the God, Jesus, he's going to present us blameless. Guess who's going to judge us? Six or seven verses say that Jesus is going to judge us. So do you really think Jesus, after becoming our sin on that cross, is really going to bring it back up to us on that day? Are you kidding me? No. No. We are faithless. He remains faithful. He became our sin so that we could become his righteousness. He's going to present us blameless. We're accepted now. We're going to be accepted then. We're blameless now. We're going to be blameless then. There's nothing left to blame. Sure, we all... Feel the blame that the enemy, enemy accuses us day and night. But, dude, the trial, it already happened. The wages of sin is death. Jesus died. Guess what we get to do? We get to celebrate. The trial's over. That whiny lawyer, Satan, he's yelling at a courthouse that is empty. He's yelling at a courthouse that is empty. The trial's over. We're forgiven. We're free. So I'll end with this. You know, what's the point of good works then, Zach? You, you say that we're all going to get the same reward. Jesus is our reward, so what's the point? Well, Ephesians 2.10 gives us a little 
idea of it. He says we're, we're God's masterpiece, we're his workmanship, created in Christ to do good work. So a few thoughts on that. Man, I don't have to worry about what I do for God. I don't have to wake up every morning and go, what do I got to do? What do I got to do? What do I got to do? Why? Because God's already set it up. He's got it rigged. God has the market cornered on our fulfillment. And what fulfills us is godliness. What fulfills us is the thing that God wants for us. It's essentially, it's love. That's what fulfills us. It's not sin. And so I don't have to wake up going, man, what do I got to do? What do I got to do? I can wake up going, God, I know you're pleased. I know you're good. I know if I do nothing good today, you're, you're still pleased with me. You're as pleased with me if I do a thousand good things today or if I do zero good things today. That's just the gospel. And so now I just get to live out of my new heart. What does my new heart want to do? Maybe I want to serve somebody today. Maybe I don't. Maybe I want to love some people today. And if I do, I get the eternal reward of participating with God. And if I don't, okay, then I, then I lose it. But for a, for a day, I lose that opportunity. But nothing changes towards God's attitudes towards me. See, God does not need to motivate us to do good works by offering us some future reward or square footage. God motivates us by living in our heart, by telling us what we really want. Child of God, do you realize that he's made you obedient from the heart, Romans 6, 17? That he's filled your heart with God's love, Romans 5, 5? That you have a pure heart? That you now want what God wants? He's written his desires on your heart, hmm. Hebrews 8, Hebrews 10. So, Wake up every day. Be yourself. I got a question. I got an answer. <laughs> How do you get it the way you understand it? Going through a theological college. Do they preach grace? Uh, no. How do, how do you come up with this? You preach it the way this church believes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so <clears throat> once again, the litmus test, I think, for any truth is does it set you free or not? Truth doesn't set you free, then we have to we have to struggle with it. So if you hear something and you go, wait a second, struggle with it, ask questions. I think can we be honest? Sometimes scripture is really hard to understand. Mm -hmm. Can we be honest? Mm -hmm. it, it sometimes it's really hard to understand. <laughs> Sit with a bunch of really brainy people for five years like I did. And it makes it even more hard to understand. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've read more books than I can count, and I had to have a dictionary beside me because I couldn't understand half these words they were saying. And so, for me, my passion is to present something simple, because I'm just simple. I'm 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 not that some genius smart. So when I come to scripture, I just ask God. God reveal this to me. And I think the more that we pr we see things in context and we we not just look at one verse single, but we look at what it, what does it look like at the paragraph level? Okay, what are the three or four verses around it saying to me as well? What is the chapter saying to me? What is the book saying to me? And what is the New Testament saying to me? Because there's some verses that I talk about, and if you just look at it, you're like, there you go, I can lose my salvation. Okay, well, what's the, what's the context of the chapter saying? What's the context of the book saying? And what's the context of the whole New Testament saying? And that's when I think when we look at reward, when we look at judgment, we see overwhelmingly that for God to judge us for something that he already judged at the cross would be for him to do double jeopardy. We you know what double jeopardy is, right? In America, you can't be tried for the same thing twice. You think God's going to do that? You know, Jesus was convicted so that we would never have to be. He was judged so that we never ha would have to be. He took what we deserve so that we could get what, what he deserved. He took our place and gave us his place. I mean, that's that great substitution. And so, for me, when I read scripture, I'm always going it through that uh, litmus test of, is this, is this truth setting me free? Sir? Oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I think you gave the simple answer and glossed over it. You said you asked God to reveal it to you. Yeah. And, and I've heard other great speakers, and they say the same thing. I ask God to reveal it to us. And we forget... <clears throat> That we have that power. And he does that in a thousand different ways. He does it through you and you and you. He does it through a book. He does it through uh, a song. He does it through 
um, a, a ton of different things. And sometimes we got to be patient. So, you know, <clears throat> one of the struggles that I have is that I, I, um, I, I'm what you call a doer. I, I want to get things done real quick. I'm learning, okay, you can slow down a little bit. <coughs> and so I would really love, there's some people in here who are struggling with sin. Can we be honest, right? Uh, some of us were struggling with sin. Maybe we're struggling with the sin we've struggled with for a long time. And we're thinking, God, why have you not freed me from that yet? And, and so you come to me or you come to a preacher, you go, what's the answer? And we go, well, the gospel's the answer. Okay, well, I tried the gospel, and it's not working right now. And what I've learned is that time and truth is what it's all about. Amen. When, when the first day you heard the grace message, did all those old thoughts just immediately go away? <laughs> no, it was time and truth. Truth replacing those old thoughts, those old beliefs, those old thoughts, those old lies about you, those old sin patterns, those old <laughs> false beliefs. Truth in time, friends. And so I think the more we, we live and the more that we get truth, these things start to become clear and clear and clear. And it's, 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 it's the gospel way. And definitely there's times when that light bulb comes off and that freedom comes immediately, right? Mm -hmm. And then there's other times where it's truth in time. Truth yeah. in time. And sometimes we, we want to rush that. And, and God... God's patient, and he is not in a hurry. And his biggest concern is, hey, I just want to be with you. I want to show you every single moment of every single day that you're good to go, that there's nothing wrong with you, and that these, these, these other questions that you've got, we're going to get to that. We're going to address that. And it's going to happen one way or the other. God's got it for us. Amen. Uh, you said you judge it by whether it sets you free or, or not. I've got another another way that goes along with that is Jesus said, my burden is light, my yoke is easy. Does, is it an easy, is it easy and light? If it's not, it, it's it's not for us. Yeah. You know that? Yeah. I just quit anything that, anything that comes to my mind, is this going to be easy and light? Does it go along with the light burden, easy yoke? Yeah, it's mm. good. Does it create rest? Yeah. If it doesn't, then let's let's yes. question it. And and yeah. let's let's understand rest, right? Yeah. What does rest mean? Does rest mean I'm a lazy grace hippie? No. no. Because that's a boring life. So what am I just gonna sit on my hands and go, Grace, 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 Grace? Or am I just gonna live? Dude, Christ in us, the hope of glory, now that's an adventure. That is an adventure. Christ in you. Every moment of every day. Now, that's a fun adventure. It goes along with what you said. Be yourself. Be yourself. Yeah. Amen. I, I think uh, you said something. I, I really love it because uh, God is, is giving us the chance to be us every day. Mm -hmm. And he is transforming ourselves to his self. It's kind of like put it for him and starting, we can start acting like him. Mm -hmm. And it's not because we want to do something or we need to do something. Because the love in Jesus and us is making us w walk that way. Mm -hmm. And it's like you said, I, I really like, it's not easy. Yeah, It's not easy. Sometimes I ask you a question before you eat. and, and, and uh, It's not easy, but it's very peaceful when you see that God hand moving in your life. Oh, yeah. And it's like... Oh wow, I crossed from these, but God is faithful and He's here with me. And after I crossed for that, I learned something I don't even know before. Right. And it's making peace and joy and gratefulness because we there because yeah. we are part of the family. Yeah, that's you know religion. Religion says follow, 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 imitate, imitate, imitate. We don't really see that in the New Testament epistles. You know, after the Gospels, of course, they were following Jesus. Why? Because he was physically walking. So they were physically following him. But as followers of Jesus now, I would say not even followers, as uniteders, as people who are united to Jesus, <coughs> are we really following him or are we just living from him? How do we live for Jesus? We live from him. He's here. We're united to him. So God is not asking us to follow some historical figure 2,000 years ago. 
But that historical figure lives in us and wants to live through us. God's not asking us really to imitate Jesus, but for us to be ourselves because us being our true selves is imitating Jesus because we're united to him. I don't know when Jesus begins and I end. That's what it means to be united, right? I'm one with Jesus. That's a crazy thought. I'm as close to Jesus as I'll ever be. I'm not getting closer to him. If you're united to Christ, if he lives in you, then how close is your Jesus? And what does that mean when we say, I need to follow him. I need to do what he does. I don't have to try to be Jesus. Jesus is Jesus. Yeah. I just got to be me. And being me and trusting Jesus and letting Jesus live through me and letting Jesus express his life through me is the same thing. Isn't that good news? Amen. Amen. Anything else? No. That was good. Awesome. Good. Well, let's pray and then uh, we can go home and take a nap. <laughs> yeah. Father, thank you for who you are. We're so thankful, God, that what you did at the cross, that you took our sin so that we would never have to be judged or put on trial or condemned or shamed or guilted, that you looked at our entire life, past, present, future, you looked at our entire life and you chose to take them all away. And now no sin surprises you. No sin takes you by surprise. You're not disappointed with us but you're pleased with us. You're not shaming us, but you're reminding us you're, we're clean. You're not guilting us, but you're showing us how much grace you have for us. Thank you that the cross is enough, that what you did for us is enough, that it worked the first time, that it doesn't need a repeat. Thank you that we can do good works, not out of a have-to motivation, not out of a hopefully I'll get more square footage, but we can do good works simply because you love us, and we love you, and we just want to participate in your life here and now. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, guys.